Welcome back to AC. Welcome back to ACX University. I'm your host, Hannah Wall, and today's episode is Performance Perfection, Go Behind the Mic. I'm here at Audible Studios for a special look at a recording and coaching session featuring director Kat Lambricks and talent Sarah Malo Christensen. Today, you'll see what it's like to perform the top genres, including romance, nonfiction, science fiction, and mysteries and thrillers, and see what it's like to receive feedback. Let's meet our players. Hi, I'm Kat Lambricks. I'm a director here at Audible Studios, and today I'm going to be in the booth coaching with Sarah Malo Christensen. I'm Sarah Malo Christensen. I'm an Audible approved producer. I've been narrating for about two years and have done 50 books, uh, about 25 of those on ACX, and I'm psyched to work with Kat today. I'm hoping to get tips on differentiating between the different genres because I think it's really useful, and especially as I do more books and in a shorter amount of time and they can all tend to blend together, it's really nice to have genre-specific tips to keep in mind. Audiobook coaching is really important because everybody has something that they can work on, especially when exploring new genres or reading different books, maybe with a type of writing that they're not familiar with. So coaching is important so that you can work on each piece individually and give each book its general due that it needs. You should consider audiobook coaching all the time. Whenever you feel like you're entering into something you haven't done before, a new genre, a new phase of your career, maybe you've developed some other skills and you're realizing that a different part of your audiobook narration career could use a little bit of a boost, you can go for coaching. And it doesn't have to be for Formal. It doesn't have to be a series of paid classes. It can be, hey, go sit down with another narrator that you like and respect and buy them some coffee and talk about some issues that you're having in your work. In coaching for audiobooks, you can expect to work on a couple of things. Uh, pacing and tone are two really, really big ones. But when you get more specific, you can talk about accents and dialects. Uh, and you can also talk about how to approach specific pieces, if it's a different genre, uh, if it's a story being told from a point of view that maybe you're not familiar with. You can address all of those things. And coaching really is up to you. When you find a coach or meet a coach or interview a coach, you can figure out what it is you want to talk about, and then you can tell them, Here are, here's a punch list of the five things that I really want to work on. Can you help me with any or all of these? And then plan out your course of coaching from there. My personal philosophy on coaching is that everybody can use it at any time that they feel they need it. And the things that I really like to focus on are pacing, which is always one that's important for me. But I also like to talk about tone when it comes to different genres and approaching different writing styles. All right, now you've met our players. Let's go into the studio and hear what's happening. All right, Sarah, whenever you are ready, uh, we're going to start with the romance piece. And let's just have you read it first, go through it one time, and then we'll do some tweaking, and then we'll go back and maybe redo a couple parts. Good? Perfect. Great. Thanks. So this is from Only a Girl's Love by Charles Garvis. Footsteps were approaching and she rose hurriedly to fly from him if need be. But Lord Lester was not a man to be turned aside. As she rose, he took her arm gently, tenderly, with loving persuasion, and drew her near to him. Come with me, he said. Do not leave me for a moment. See, the door is open. It is quite warm. We shall be alone here. Oh, my darling, do not leave me in suspense. She was powerless to resist, and he led her onto the terrace outside. Out into the dusky night. <coughs> Out into the dusky night, odorous with the breath of the flowers, and mystical in the dim light of the stars. A gentle summer, zephyr-like air stirred the trees, and the sound of the water falling over the weir came like music up the hillside. Sorry, weird noise. A nightingale sang in the woods below them. All the night seemed full of slumberous passion and unspoken love. We are alone here, Stella, he murmured. <laughs> we are... he, he did what? <laughs> exactly. He murmured. We are alone here, Stella, he murmured. Now, answer me. Listen once more, darling. I'm not tired of telling you. I shall never tire of it. Listen, I love you. I love you. The stars grew dull and misty before her eyes. The charm of his voice, of his presence, was stealing over her. Was stealing over her. 
The passionate love which burnt in her heart for him was finding its way through cool prudence. Her lips were tremulous. A sigh, long and deep, broke from them. I love you, he replied, as if the words were a spell, as indeed they were, a spell not to be resisted. Give me your answer, Stella. Come close to me. Whisper it. Whisper, I love you, or send me away. But you will not do that. No, you shall not do that. And forgetful of his vow to be gentle with her, he put his arm round her, drew her to him, and kissed her. It was the first kiss. A thrill ran through her. The sky seemed to sink, the whole night to pause as if it were waiting. With a shudder of exquisite pleasure, mingled with that subtle pain which ecstasy always brings in its train, she laid her head upon his breast and, hiding her eyes, murmured, I love you. That was great. How did it feel? Good. I Sorry, I kept getting distracted by little, like, chest gurgles. <laughs> <laughs> totally happens. Um I I really liked it a lot. Um, just a few like really small notes. Yeah, of course. Um, take you can take a little bit more of a pause between the dialogue and the the he said she said. Okay. Um, there was one place in there I think where the the he murmured was kind of still in his voice. Oh, okay. And especially when you're doing an accent, it can be hard to delineate them mm -hmm. um, when it's obviously not your natural accent. So feel free to take a little more space. If anything, if it needs to be tightened up in editing, we can do that. Hmm. Um, but, you know, otherwise I really liked it. There were a lot of sort of longer lists of things in here, yeah. which I know sometimes can be hard, but I think you did a really good job of, of letting them flow. Okay. Um, so let's, this is like a super dramatic scene. Like I, I was so excited to get to the end yeah. where she answered him. Um, but, but let's do... Um, Let's do just kind of the first five paragraphs up through where he tells her that he loves her. Okay. Um, and just focus on, um, you know, focus on setting those things apart. Um, but in terms of the tone for romance, I think, especially given the period that this one's from, I think it's, I think the pacing is really good. Um, and I really, I like the accent a lot. You know, obviously you're really good at it, so we'll go with it. It is my natural accent. I talk like this all the time. Obviously. All right, so uh, we take it from the top and just down through the middle of it. Okay. Cool. Footsteps were approaching, and she rose hurriedly to fly from him if need be. But Lord Lester was not a man to be turned aside. As she rose, he took her arm, gently, tenderly, with loving persuasion, and drew her near to him. Come with me, he said. Do not leave me for a moment. See, the door is open. It is quite warm. We shall be alone here. Oh, my darling, do not leave me in suspense. She was powerless to resist, and he led her onto the terrace outside. Out into the dusky night, odorous with the breath of the flowers and the mist... Out into the dusky night, odorous with the breath of the flowers, and mystical in the dim light of the stars. A gentle summer zephyr-like air stirred the trees, and the sound of the water falling over the weir came up the music like <laughs> sorry. The sound of the water falling over the weir came like music up the hillside. A nightingale sang in the woods below them. All the night seemed full of slumberous passion and unspoken love. We are alone here, Stella, he murmured. Now answer me. Listen once more, darling. I am not tired of telling you. I shall never tire of it. Listen. I love you. I love you. Awesome. We can stop it there. I didn't take as much of a pause after Stella. Sorry. I no, 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 it still used. worked for okay. sure. Um, note about Lord Lester. Yeah. Um, 
So I think I think he's kind of a powerful guy, but I think he's also got a little bit more tender tenderness in mm-hmm. him for her. Um, so let's kind of lighten him up a little bit. Sure. He sounds like a little too serious, and I think he's he's, he's excited that they the get pirate. to be alone. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> if he were, it would be a different book, probably still a romance. Right. It'd be only a girl's pirate by Charles Garvis. Yeah. So let's just try and kind of lighten his tone a little bit. Sure. Um, and we can just do, let's just do that last paragraph where, where he's talking to her. So from We Are Alone Here? Yes, please. We are alone here, Stella, he murmured. <laughs> Sorry. We are alone here, Stella, he murmured. Now answer me. Listen once more, darling. I am not tired of telling you. I shall never tire of it. Listen, I love you. I love you. Yeah, that was excellent. That was really awesome. Um, I liked how you lightened him, especially right in the middle where he says, listen once more, darling, because that sentence could go either way. He could be, like, being really firm with her and, like, you're going to have to love me. Or he can be very tenderly kind of preparing to declare his devotion. So I think that was good. Um, One other thing I wanted to mention. So the paragraph before that first sentence, uh, out into the dusky night, Mm -hmm. is not a full sentence. Uh, Correct. <laughs> with the subject and a verb. Um, and sometimes we run into this. Um, and yeah. and you did exactly the right thing to just sort of go with it. Um, the intention is written, I think, comes through, but sometimes it can be a little jarring when you come across something like that in a text. So I think your instinct was was just right on that one. Yeah, it's long and, and um, flowery enough that you can kind of forget by the time you get to the end that it didn't happen for the sentence. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Was there anything else you wanted to work on in that one, or do you want to move on? No, I mean, the challenge for me with sort of period pieces is that I don't, like, get too, like, I'm in a high school drama production of Lady Windermere's fan. Like, too, like, you know, melodramatic about it, sort of. But it's a fine line, right? Because it is kind of melodramatic. Um, So, yeah, as long as you think that was an okay level of melodrama, then I'm good. I do. I mean, I think this is obviously a, a pivotal part in the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wouldn't do it as much for the rest of the book. Obviously, there's a lot more around this that's a little bit more narrative, right. and I would keep it lighter for that, but I think that that was appropriate for this part. Okay, cool. Thank you. Sarah did a great job with the romance piece, and I really liked that she picked an accent that she was strong with. She knew that she was good with the accent, and she went with it, and that was really great to see in the booth a narrator who knows what their strengths are and plays to them. Some of the hallmarks of narrating in romance are being really, really good at interplay between your characters. You want to be able to have dialogue in there that flows really easily, that you can go back and forth between your characters and make it feel fluid. Another thing that's really important in romance is to be able to tell a story and bring it out because romance really is about a relationship between two people and so you want to be able to tell that story and bring your listener along with it. So being fluid and well paced and not getting too too wrapped up in your character's drama but more telling their story is really important when it comes to romance. I felt good about the romance piece that we worked on. I really enjoyed it. It's nice to get an opportunity to work on a Regency piece since I do a lot of contemporary romance and accent challenges are always really fun. Uh, When you're working in accents and dialects, one of the things that's really important is not to get too cartoony and too over the top. You want them to be believable. And a lot of people will work with an accent, maybe it's a minor character, something that they're not quite great at doing or they're not super confident in. And what I would say, especially in that case, is to be really careful with it and just give a little subtlety, just give a little uh, a hint or a suggestion of the accent. And don't try and overdo it and don't try and hit it too hard because then it's gonna sound fake. So you can dial it back. There's definitely a suspension of disbelief that listeners have. They know it's you and not a crazy Irishman coming in from somewhere. So they just wanna hear a little bit of a suggestion of that to give them the flavor of the character, but they don't need a full on like Lucky Charms. My main takeaway from the romance piece was the direction Ket gave me in terms of leaving more space between the dialogue and the narrative voice pieces, which I thought was really helpful and isn't something I'd thought about before. And then also lightening up on the male character more than voice, I guess, um, was, was a really good tip and I think worked better for the piece than what I had thought first, so I was grateful for that. Handling voices of the opposite gender is really important, and it's something that can get a little hard, especially in the beginning when you're first starting out. Um, Everybody has the voice that they do for their spouse or their mom or dad, and those things tend to be 
really great and kind of fun to do, but in audiobook work, they're not entirely appropriate. So you don't want to pitch your voice way up or way down. Our listeners know that you're not going to turn into a man or turn into a woman when when you're narrating. So again, it's it's just like accents and dialects. You want to give a little bit of a flavor. You want to maybe vary your pacing. Uh, women tend to talk a little bit faster than men do. Men kind of slow it down. So you can you can vary that, and that helps a lot. And again, just a little bit of a pitch shift, but not too much. Let's do a, a, a straight read through of it, and then we'll talk about it. All right, awesome. All right, we are rolling when you're ready. The principal conquests of the Romans were achieved under the Republic, and the emperors, for the most part, were satisfied with preserving those dominions which had been acquired by the policy of the Senate, the active emulations of the consuls, and the martial enthusiasm of the people. The seven first centuries were filled with a rapid succession of triumphs, but it was reserved for Augustus to relinquish the ambitious design of subduing the whole earth. <clears throat> But it was reserved for Augustus to relinquish the ambitious design of subduing the whole earth and to introduce a spirit of moderation into the public councils. Incl inclined, by pe inclined to peace by his temper and situation, it was easy for him to discover that Rome, in her present exalted situation, had much less to hope than to fear from the chance of arms, and that, in the prosecution of remote wars, the undertaking became every day more difficult, the event more doubtful, and the possession more precarious and less beneficial. The experience of Augustus added weight to these salutary reflections, and effectually convinced him that, by the prudent vigor of his counsels, it would be easy to secure every concession which the safety or the dignity of Rome might require from the most formidable barbarians. Instead of exposing his person and his legions to the arrows of the Parthians, he obtained, by an honorable treaty, the restitution of the standards and prisoners which had been taken in the defeat of Crassus. Awesome. Are you a history buff? Yeah, I was a history major. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. But, but I don't know. I mean, I, I get excited. I feel like with nonfiction, I just like decide to get excited about it, whatever it is, you know. And I think that's the right approach too. like you have to you have to be excited about some part of it. And even if you can't be excited about the subject matter, like Rome's not totally my bag. Mm -hmm. But this was really interesting because of your tone. Yeah. And, and it wasn't um, wasn't too erudite. It, it was kind of friendly, and I always tell people, when you're describing something like this, when you're doing a nonfiction piece, pretend like you're talking to a friend of yours who's really smart, but who just happens to not know anything about this particular subject. Right. And I think that was exactly the right tone, because when you're talking to people for so long about this, you want to keep them engaged right. in the material, and you want them to feel like someone is working hard to engage them, not just spitting a bunch of information at right. you. Um. So this one I actually really, I don't have any notes okay. on this one. I really liked it. I liked the tone. Awesome. I thought the pacing was good. Um, and and I think I think we can move on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the first time I read it, I was, like, terrified. I was like, oh, no. But then I, like, read it and paid attention and was like, oh, that's so interesting. I would have thought that the emperors were the more, like, war-hungry part of whatever. A dork. But dorking out worked, apparently. It, it did. It did. And this is a lot of words. Yeah. Um, and it's a lot of kind of very big words and very long sentences right. um, that are all kind of smushed together. But I think as long as you take it like you did, sort of piece by piece, phrase by phrase, item by item in the list, I think you're going to be fine. And if you get to the point with anything, but especially with nonfiction, if you get to the point where you're feeling like, I'm not hearing this, I'm not engaging with this, my brain kind of isn't registering this, that's when it's time to take a break get a cup of coffee, you know, do some stretches, take a, a walk around the block or something just to kind of re recenter yourself on the material. Because once you lose it like that, it's very easy to lose your listener. Right. But simple things like that can help re-engage you on them. Sarah did a great job with the nonfiction piece because she was really engaged with it. She went through all of the lists in there and I think when she was doing it, she was probably seeing a lot of these things in her head. It's easy to look at a list on a page and just read it like rote, but when you're seeing these things in your head and you're listing them off as you see them, it becomes a lot more engaging. 
Um, so I don't want to speak for what she did, but I have a good feeling that maybe that was part of it, which is a great trick to use in the booth, especially when you're reading something that maybe you're not so engaged in. Once you start to picture it, it brings you back to the scene and it, it brings your narration back to the forefront and it keeps it engaged. I loved the nonfiction piece because as was maybe apparent, I'm a huge dork, <laughs> especially when it comes to history. I love it. So I loved finding the interest in a piece that was really dry um, and communicating that. I, I really enjoy it. I love that genre. So that was fun for me. When narrating nonfiction, one of the things that's really important to keep in mind is your tone. You don't want to get too pedantic with people and you don't want to get too dry because then you'll lose your listener. People really want to hear you explain this concept to them. So you want to pretend like you're talking to a really good friend who's really smart but just happens to not know anything about the particular topic. And you might not know anything about the topic either, but it's your job as an actor to sound like you do. When you're doing nonfiction, pronunciations are of course really important because you're going to be talking about real people who may still be alive and may be listening and hear you say their name. So you want to make sure that you're getting it just right. And one of the best ways to do that is to look for an interview with the person online. And you always want to look for them saying their own name. You don't want to look for an interviewer saying their name because sometimes the interviewer is wrong and you want to make sure that you're getting the exact right pronunciation. The other thing I want to advise is that when you're working with an author who uh, maybe is not American, a lot of times we have authors who are Brits or who are Irish and you consult them on pronunciation, uh, just make sure that you're getting the right one and it can be the difference between Wozniak and Wozniak and you want to make sure that you're getting it right for your audience. As far as nonfiction goes, I think finding the joy in whatever you're doing and finding a way to geek out about that subject, even if it's not something that you were interested in before, is crucial. Because if you're not interested in it, no one wants to hear you talk about it. So finding a way to get into it, even if it seems dry, like there are people who love that. There's someone who wrote about it, right? Like you just have to embrace it and geek out about it. Some of the hard parts of narrating nonfiction are when it's something either you don't know a lot about or you're not interested in. It can be easy to go on autopilot, especially if you've been in the booth for a couple hours that day already. You can start to coast and your voice can start to get kind of a rhythm to it that becomes a little bit boring. So when something like that happens, get up, you know, get outside, get some sunlight, take a little walk, just re-engage yourself. Do something physical to bring yourself back to awareness of what it is you're reading. Let's head into the sci-fi piece. Okay. Ready? Yes. All right, go for it. So this is A World is Born by Lee Brackett. <sighs> Out from the cleft where Mel Gray worked, across the flat plain of rock stripped naked by the wind that raved across it, lay the deep valley that sheltered the heart of the Molten Project. Hot springs joined to form a steaming river, Vegetation grew savagely under the huge sun. The air kept at al the air kept at almost constant temperature by the blanketing effect of the hot springs was stagnant and heavy. But up above, high over the copper cables that crossed every valley where men ventured, the eternal wind of mercury screamed and snarled between the naked cliffs. Three concrete domes crouched on the valley floor housing barracks, tool shops, kitchens, storehouses, and executive quarters, connected by underground passages. Beside the smallest dome, joined to it by a heavily barred tunnel, was an insulated hangar containing the only spaceship on Mercury. In the small dome, John Moulton leaned back from a pile of reports, took a pinch of Martian snuff, sneezed lustily, and said, Jill? I think we've done it. The gray-eyed, black-haired young woman turned from the quartzite window through which she had been watching the gathering storm overhead. The thunder from the other valleys reached them as a dim barrage which, at this time of Mercury's year, was never still. I don't know, she said. It seems that nothing can happen now, and yet... It's been too easy. Easy, snorted Moulton. We've broken our backs fighting these valleys, and our nerves fighting time, but we've licked them. Excellent. Um, I really, I like this piece a lot. 
I think it's a really good mix of, of kind of narrative and then there's that little bit of dialogue at the bottom. Um, one thing with this one that I would have you do is maybe take more of a viewpoint on it. Um, I always say that the narrator is a character and the mm -hmm. narrator has a point of view and I think you can bring that out a little bit more in this one. So it's definitely, um, it's a bit of an objective description, but your narrator is kind of seeing all of this happen on Mercury and, and there's some sense there and I think it's hard to know without reading the rest of the piece, yeah. right? But there's some sense of maybe a little bit of awe and wonderment yeah. uh, because of the magnitude of this. There's right. also a little bit of fear there. There's a steaming river and savage vegetation and a huge sun. Um, and there, I, I think there's definitely a bit of, uh, you know, also respect for, for what's going on. Yeah. Um, the fact that they're, oh my gosh, they're on Mercury, which is like crazy. Um, and I think that listeners, when they're listening to sci-fi, they, they do want a little bit of that, a little bit more kind of perspective on it. Yeah. So let's take the first, let's just do the whole thing again. Okay. And maybe come at it, you know, a little bit more from that direction. Okay. Cool? Yes. Thank All you. right. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Out of the cleft where Mel Gray worked across a flat plain of rock stripped naked by the wind that raved across it, lay a deep valley that sheltered the heart of the Molten Project. Hot springs joined to form a steaming river. Vegetation grew savagely under the huge sun. The air, kept at almost constant temperature by the blanketing effect of the hot springs, was stagnant and heavy. But up above, High over the copper cables that crossed every valley where men ventured, the eternal wind of mercury screamed and snarled between the naked cliffs. Three concrete domes crouched on the valley floor, housing barracks, tool shops, kitchens, storehouses, and executive quarters, connected by underground passages. Beside the smallest dome, joined to it by a heavily barred tunnel, was an insulated hangar containing the only spaceship on Mercury. In the small dome, John Moulton leaned back from a pile of reports, took a pinch of Martian snuff, sneezed lustily, and said, Jill, I think we've done it. The gray-eyed, black-haired young woman turned from the quartzite window through which she had been watching the gathering storm overhead. The thunder from the other valleys reached them as a dim barrage, which, at this time of Mercury's year, was never still. I don't know, she said. It seems that nothing can happen. It seems that nothing can happen now, and yet, it's been too easy. Easy, snorted Moulton. We've broken our backs fighting these valleys, and our nerves fighting time. But we've licked them. Great. There was definitely a difference, especially in the beginning. There was a little bit more emphasis on a lot of the descriptors, and I think that was just right. How do you feel about it? I like it. Um, yeah, I tried to make it more like, welcome to Jurassic Park. Totally. Like, Absolutely. <laughs> and I think in the next scene after this, that's when the dinosaur comes. I, like, I, we didn't include that in the excerpt, I'm pretty but sure. yeah. the T-Rex is, like, right around the corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But don't worry, because Jill's going to ride it to victory. <laughs> I think we're, we should just write the ending to this one ourselves, and then sure. we'll sell it on ACX. A World is Born by Lee Brackett, Kat Lambrix, and Sarah Mollo Christensen. When you're narrating fantasy and science fiction, you want to make sure that you're taking the story and you're bringing it to the forefront and you're, you're really describing what it is that the author has described in their book. And this is another place where it's great to picture what it is they're talking about and then bring that out in your narration as you're telling it. You may not have seen the moons of Mars, but you can definitely describe them. And that's, again, part of your job as a narrator is to be descriptive of these things and bring them through in the way that the author has asked. So that's a great time to talk to your author, maybe give them a call, see if you can Skype with them, and talk to them about what their intentions were behind the book, how they envision the world, and just get a little bit more depth because that's going to bring more to your narration when you're reading in the booth. When you're narrating sci-fi and fantasy, one of the things you definitely want to be really aware of are made-up languages and made-up words. 
a lot of our listeners are fans of series or maybe other books in the same world by this author, and they have a lot of opinions, as do the authors, on how these words are said. So it's another great time to be in touch with your author and just ask them for their thoughts on this. Um, the other part that I would be really, really careful about with sci-fi and fantasy is that you're going to have crazy characters, you're going to have aliens and talking narwhals and all kinds of great, crazy stuff that you're going to want to give them these amazing voices and you're going to want to show your range. Make sure you're not going too far. You never want to damage your vocal cords and you never know when a talking narwhal in book one is going to become the main character in book eight and you're going to have to do that voice the entire way through. So be gentle to yourself, um, show off your strengths and show off some kooky accents and voices you can do, but just make sure that it's sustainable in the long run. For the fantasy piece, I think Kat's note about finding more awe and wonder in it was really useful for me because it's easy to get kind of wrapped up in the descriptions of worlds that are unlike our own and just sort of like flow through that. But getting lost in that world is crucial, right? So kind of like, trying to see it with fresh eyes, even though you've read it before, is important for anything, obviously, but particularly for fantasy, where there's all this world building and fantastical settings. I think that was a really good tip to just sort of like embrace that element of it, since that's such a huge part of the genre. Sarah did great in the booth with the fantasy piece. Uh, it was a great piece to work on because it did have the dialogue with the male and female characters in there, but it also had a great, great bit of description in the beginning. And she did a good job actually taking direction on this one when I had her describe it a little bit more and when I had her give a viewpoint on what this landscape was like, she really took that, she emphasized the right words and she gave it just a little bit more, which was the difference between something that was a little flatter and something that was a lot more engaging for the listener. Why don't we move on to the, to the mystery and thriller piece? Okay. Great, and let's, uh, let's dive in when you're ready. Okay, this is The Sound of Silence by Barbara Constant. Talk. <coughs> Good advice. Talk, Dr. Andrews reminded her, his voice so soft that it could almost have come from inside her own mind. We were picnicking, she said. A whole lot of us. Somehow... I wandered away from the others. One minute, the hill was bright with sun, and the next, it was deep in shadows, and the wind that had been merely cool was downright cold. She shivered and glanced around, expecting her mother to be somewhere near, holding out a sweater or jacket. There was no one at all in sight. Even then, she never thought of being frightened. She turned to retrace her steps, there was a big tree that looked familiar, and a funny rock behind it, half buried in the hillside. She was trudging toward it, humming under her breath, when the worry thoughts began to reach her. Only a little creek, so I don't think she could have fallen in. Not really any bears around here. But she never gets hurt. Creek, bear, twisted ankle, dark cold. She had veered from her course and started in the direction of the first thought, but now they were coming from all sides and she had no idea at all which way to go. She ran wildly then, first one way, then the other, sobbing and calling. Lucilla. The voice sliced into the night, and the dark mountainside and the frightened child were gone. She shuddered a little, reminiscently, and put her hand over her eyes. Great. So a couple of notes on this one, um, and, and these are mostly tone related. Mm -hmm. uh, with mystery and thriller, I think the more you get to the dramatic parts, the slower you want to go. Okay. Which is a little counterintuitive, especially to the way we read. Like, I know when I'm reading, yeah. oh my god, let's get there, let's go, I'm going to skim, I'm going to read really, really fast. But you kind of want to make your listener wait for it a little bit. Sure. You want to, you make them Easy sort route. of lean forward a little bit more and, oh my god, what's going to happen? Sure. Um, so I think that you can, you know, just make sure to keep the pacing really steady. Okay. So don't slow down there. Just don't speed up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think slowing down is like overdoing it a little bit, but just watch that you don't speed up too much. Okay. Um, and then the other note that I would have, um, which is kind of particular to this piece. Um, but in the end, when Dr. Andrew says her name, 
it kind of snaps her right back into the moment. Mm -hmm. And so rather than kind of narrating that almost from Lucilla's perspective, I would bring that back to a more neutral narrator voice. So um, let's try it again. Sure. Cool. Talk, Dr. Andrews reminded her, his voice so soft that it could almost have come from inside her own mind. We were picnicking, she said. A whole lot of us. Somehow I wandered away from the others. One minute, the hill was bright with sun, and the next, it was deep in shadows, and the wind that had been merely cool was downright cold. She shivered and glanced around, expecting her mother to be somewhere near, holding out a sweater or jacket. There was no one at all in sight. Even then, she never thought of being frightened. She turned to retrace her steps. There was a big tree that looked familiar, and a funny rock behind it, half buried in the hillside. She was trudging toward it, humming under her breath, when the worry thoughts began to reach her. Only a little creek, so I don't think she could have fallen in. Not really any bears around here. But she never gets hurt. Creek. Bear. Twisted ankle. Dark. Cold. She had veered from her course and started in the direction of the first thought, but now they were coming from all sides and she had no idea at all which way to go. She ran wildly then, first one way, then the other, sobbing and calling. Lucilla. The voice sliced into the night, and the dark mountainside and the frightened child were gone. She shuddered a little, reminiscently, and put her hand over her eyes. That was awesome. That was really great. Yeah. Yep. How do you feel about this one? I feel good. Yeah. I, d- I just decided that that was Dr. Andrews at the end because I don't actually know, but that seems likely, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's just the two of them in the scene. I think she's in her therapist's office. Yeah. Um, yeah, I liked how your tone really changed in the middle. And even once you get... So there are sort of two lines of dialogue that she has and then it goes into a narrative but it's still told from her perspective right. so that was like the right impulse to tell it in in that tone cool yeah yeah no i liked this one i i, I uh i was a little worried about where it's like just a list of things that are scary do you know what i mean like bear cold twisted but um yeah i just tried to keep moving through that so it didn't seem too like i don't know It wasn't, no, I think you did a good job. It wasn't like a boom, boom, boom kind of list, but it wasn't overly dramatic either. And I think this is one of the spots where paying attention to punctuation really is your friend because you're seeing it there and you can look at the punctuation a little bit objectively Mm -hmm. while you mix that in with your performance. I love thrillers and crime and stuff like that. And Kat's note about slowing down when it got more intense was exactly right. And I actually will think about that on books that I have scheduled now. So I'm really glad that she gave me that note and it was really useful. But um, I really enjoyed the different levels in that piece, right? Like the part that's sort of like internal monologue going into her experience back in time, like in her memory, the part that's in the present, um, the dialogue. That's something that I really appreciate about more like psych- psychological thriller pieces is it gives you the opportunity to mix it up like that. And it's so, the, the interplay between those different sort of like moods is n- necessary, but also really fun to use those tools. When you're narrating thriller and suspense, you wanna make sure that you're really building up that level of tension and that level of suspense for your listener. You wanna make sure you're not going too fast and you're not rushing into those action scenes and you're not rushing to the conclusion, you wanna take your time and let the story unfold and let your listener take that journey. Sarah did really well with the suspense piece when she got into the head of the character in that middle paragraph where she was narrating and she was 
really embodying that character as she told the story. And then she shifted right out of it in the end when it came back to a more narrative passage. And I was super happy to hear that because as just as a listener, that's really what you want is someone who can shift like that and who can pull you through the story in the right way. So some of the corrections that we worked on in the booth with Sarah that I think are applicable across the genre, across narrators, are to be really careful uh, when you're going from the dialogue to the he said, she said, you always want to take a beat there to separate it. There's no need to rush into it. And another thing on that note is you don't want to rush through your narrative just to get to your dialogue. The narrative is just as important and the narrator is another character in your story. So make sure that you're not speeding through that just to get to the fun dialogue parts. Kat's note about pacing uh, in scenes that get more intense was just so useful to me, and I know that I will use that uh, in the books that I'm working on this week. And it's just a really good reminder to get, a good reminder of the power of getting quieter and slower to make the listener lean in, as opposed to just like flying through this exciting storyline as it's happening, because experiencing it and telling the story are obviously really different. So that was a really good tip that I'm excited to use. The biggest improvement that I helped Sarah with in the studio was when I had her slow down at a part that became more dramatic. Our impulse as, as readers is to rush through it and get to the end and find out who did it and get to all the cool stuff. But as a narrator, you really wanna take it slow and you wanna pace it out so that you're giving it little by little just as it was written to your listener. So we had a situation in, in the booth with this piece where it was a little bit unclear who was speaking in the last paragraph, and it's something that Sarah and I talked about. When you're home, when you're narrating, uh, this is a great time to contact your author or maybe call in another narrator friend and say, hey, can you give this a read? Can you maybe tell me what you think here? Uh, who might be talking? Is, is there maybe a missing word here? Is there a typo? If something doesn't make sense, always question it and just dive a little deeper into it. Lots of times you'll find an answer and it might be an easy one. Sometimes you won't find an answer and you'll just have to make a creative choice and go with it. So I'd say when you have to do that, just be confident in your choice and move ahead. Don't dwell on it too much and, and just keep going. Receiving feedback can be challenging and more so when you know that people will be watching a video of it, but feedback is invaluable, right? I mean, there's no one who's too good for coaching. Uh, so there's always room for growth. And anytime someone as experienced as Kat is willing to give it to you, you have to make the most of that opportunity. So I'm really grateful for the feedback. Um, and I hope that it encourages everyone to get as much coaching as they can, whenever they can. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of ACX University. I hope you learned a lot about performing tips and you'll take some of those back into your own recording sessions. Thanks to Sarah and Kat for being our guests today and we'll see you next time at ACX University.